Welcome, everybody. I'm going to give it a minute here to let everyone come into the Zoom webinar. Okay, we can get started as people continue to trickle in. Uh, welcome. This is the third day of our seventh biannual Blueprint Leadership Summit, a meeting of the top leadership minds and luminaries in the business space brought to you by Conant Leadership. We're so happy to have you all with us today. Today is a very special day. We're celebrating Administrative Professionals Day. Uh, I'm Amy Fetterman. I'm Conant Leadership's Director of Content and Editor-in-Chief and co-author with Doug Conant of the book for which this whole summit is named The Blueprint, Six Practical Steps to Lift Your Leadership to New Heights. And I'll be helping with intro, outros, and moderating the Q&A portion of today's program. We are honored today to welcome not one, but two amazing guests, Lucy Brazier, a renowned author and CEO of Marcham Publishing, and Bonnie Lowe Craman, celebrated author, TEDx speaker, and former celebrity assistant to Olympia Dukakis. And I'll more fully introduce them in just a few minutes. Together today, they'll be talking about how to develop your leadership superpowers as an administrative assistant. At Conant Leadership, we define leadership as the art and science of influencing others in a specific direction. And admins have tremendous influence in their organizations and thus tremendous leadership capacity. And we want to specifically shout out our Chief Executive Administrator, Diana Hansen, uh, without whom Conant Leadership would fall into complete disrepair. <laughs> and we also have a special course for admins in development that I'll tell you more about at the end of the program. But before we jump in, as always, I'll introduce Conant Leadership, share some housekeeping, and formally introduce our host, Doug Conant, and our very special guests. If you're new to Conant Leadership, welcome. If not, the following spiel is going to be very familiar. <laughs> Conant Leadership's mission is championing leadership that works in the 21st century. Our mission is about making meaning, not money. Our founder and host today, Doug Conant, takes no salary and all profits after covering our operating costs are donated to enlightened organizations whose leadership is moving the world forward. We offer free resources like this summit as part of our commitment to providing high impact resources for leaders today. In case you weren't with us on Monday or Tuesday, I will quickly, re quickly repeat that the theme of this week is action. We believe that no matter how chaotic the world becomes, leaders must move from anxiety into action. And the first step is getting more anchored in who you are, what you believe, why you're called to leadership. All of our panelists this week are gonna give us practical, actionable tips for leveraging self-knowledge to make a difference. And there's some info about how this idea relates to the concepts in the blueprint at the links in the chat. Now some quick housekeeping about today's Q&A. You can type your questions for our panelists into the Q&A box in the bottom center of your Zoom screen at any time. When we get to the Q&A portion of the program, I'll ask our panelists your submitted questions and we'll try to get to as many as we can. If you're using the chat feature, I won't be able to moderate comments or questions there. It just moves way too fast. But my colleagues will be monitoring for technical questions and sharing helpful links in support of our programming. But again, to ask our panelists questions, please use that Q&A box. Next, I will introduce our host, Conant Leadership founder and CEO, Doug Conant. Doug Conant is the only former Fortune 500 CEO who is a New York Times and Wall Street Journal bestselling author, a top 50 leadership innovator, a top 100 leadership speaker, and a top 100 most influential author in the world. He has served as president of Nabisco Foods, president and CEO of Campbell Soup Company, and chairman of Avon Products. He is also former chairman and current board member of CECP, that's Chief Executives for Corporate Purpose, and he serves on the board of the Partnership for Public Service, and has served on countless for-profit and nonprofit boards throughout his 45 plus year career. Doug is also a seasoned teacher and highly sought after keynote speaker. He is a former instructor of leadership at the Higher Ambition Leadership Alliance, and he teaches the concepts advanced in the blueprint to leaders in his signature leadership development course, the Blueprint Bootcamp. He's also a LinkedIn learning instructor, 
whose inaugural course, Finding Your Leadership Purpose with Doug Conant, launched last year. Deeply entrenched in the contemporary leadership conversation as a teacher, advisor, speaker, and mentor, Doug speaks daily to leaders on the front lines of the modern workplace, and he's delighted to continue the conversation today. Finally, it's my pleasure to formally introduce our featured guests today, Lucy Brazier and Bonnie Lowe Craman. Lucy Brazier is one of the world's leading authorities on the administrative profession, author of The Modern Day Assistant, Build Your Influence and Boost Your Potential. She is the CEO of March and Publishing, a global force synonymous with world-class conferences and training, including Executive Support Live and Modern Day Assistant, and home of Executive Support Magazine, the gold standard of training in print for administrative professionals. Lucy is passionate about ensuring the assistant role is truly recognized as a career and not just a job, and is dedicated to supporting the development of both senior and aspiring administrative professionals. She is keynoted at almost every major conference for assistants in the world and has a unique overview of the role and where it is heading. Delighted to welcome Lucy to the program. Thank Bonnie you, Craman is a TEDx speaker and a former celebrity assistant to Oscar winner Olympia Dukakis. She is a workplace expert who has walked in the shoes of the staff and has written about it in her books, Be the Ultimate Assistant and Staff Matters. Bonnie has trained assistants in 13 countries and at the Wharton School, British Parliament, Four Seasons, Maui, Starbucks, and Amazon. Her writing has appeared in Harvard Business Review and her work was profiled in Forbes. She is on the editorial board and is a contributing writer for Lucy Brazier's Executive Support Magazine. Bonnie is known for her passionate commitment to transform the workplace for everyone. In order to build an ultimate workplace for our children, she works to end discrimination, close the wage gap, and to break the cycle of workplace bullying. So welcome, Bonnie. Welcome, Lucy. And with that, I will turn it over to Doug. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. My, my goodness. Uh, we have uh, a very highly credentialed set of guests here. It is wonderful to see you again, Bonnie. And Thank you, uh, wonderful to have uh, this first opportunity to meet with you, Lucy. Um, we will uh, work our way through a few questions that will prime the pump for about a half an hour. And then Amy will be surveying all the feedback we're getting and raise a few questions that will be directed towards you in the last half hour. And we're going to make sure that Lucy is set free exactly at one o'clock because she has a full day plan uh, in Nashville, Tennessee. And uh, uh, and I hope that goes well. She's everywhere, uh, just like mm -hmm. Bonnie. Bonnie is everywhere too. Uh, I was starting to say to uh, to Lucy earlier, uh, when, my, when my children were younger, we used to love watching Dora the Explorer and Dora was everywhere. And you two are everywhere as well. I just, uh, I do a lot, but I'm nothing compared to the two of you, which is sort of a statement about uh, the energy and the commitment administrative assistants have uh, to, their, to their work. And we're gonna get into that. Um, you know, I, just to get the conversation started, we sort of regard you two as the dynamic duo who champion the opportunities for uh, for administrative assistance. And as we try and champion leadership that works in the 21st century, you're championing leadership that works for administrative assistance in the 21st century. And it doesn't look anything like it did in the 20th century. And that's a good thing. It's, it's, it could be worse but it's not good enough. Uh, I, before we get into what we need to do to make things better, uh, let's start with Bonnie. Bonnie, how would you uh, characterize the challenges that today's administrative assistants are experiencing relative to when you and I were more actively in the workplace? Yeah, wow. Doug, thank you. It's so great to be here again this year. And thank you, Amy and uh, Lucy. It's always a joy to be here with you. You are, I stand on your shoulders as well. Um, I don't know about so, that. <laughs> you know, I think it's true for most anyone in the administrative professional 
profession that even if we've been doing this work for a long time, there's a lot about the workplace of 2024 that feels new, doesn't mm -hmm. it? There's yeah. the pandemic through the workplace into the air like a deck of cards and um, we're companies are still feeling the the impact of all mm -hmm. those changes that happened during the the pandemic. And so that has meant the restructure of systems and structures. Job descriptions are all over the place because we were in we were all in a red hot emergency for a long time. And now that that emergency is over, companies are struggling with what do we have now? This new, I refer to it as the new workplace. Mm -hmm. So in terms of administrative professionals, in the creation of those new systems and structures, the smartest leaders are the ones who are involving the administrative staff in the creation of those systems. Yeah. But too often, they're not involved in those conversations. They're not given the power or the authority to help design them. So, you know, Doug, you and I never mince words with each other. Mm -hmm. I can tell you that the main challenge continues to be that too many administrative professionals around the world feel underutilized, undervalued, and therefore under leveraged. So that is the landscape that administrative professionals are navigating this new thing that we're that is that is revealing itself. Um, and the reality is that the administrative professionals of the world are among the most resourceful, resilient, and creative group of people. And um, my strongest words for leaders is to tap them, leverage them, utilize the people who are already on the payroll. Yeah. Well, thank you. Uh, Lucy, how, would you add to that or amplify any thoughts that uh, Bonnie had? Very definitely. And first of all, happy Administrative Professionals Week to everybody out there. Administrative Professionals Day today, we're celebrating you big time. But, you know, it's so interesting, Doug, because I am doing more and more training of executives and HR departments. In fact, I am saying every time I go into an organization to go and train them, I want to have an hour with the HR department and I want to have an hour with the executives to talk about how they are utilizing their assistance. And what becomes very clear is that neither the executives nor the HR departments, nor in some instances, the assistants themselves are clear about why it is that the organization employs them. And when I ask them that question, they will say things like, well, to do the things that the executives don't want to do or to do the small stuff or to fill the gaps. And actually, to me, it's very clear that the reason that they're employed is to give back, back time. They are not gatekeepers of people, they are gatekeepers of time. And what that means is that their role is to make sure that every dollar of their executives very expensive salaries are best spent, because every minute we then save the executives is a minute of their salary that drops to the bottom line. And when they realize that, suddenly everything becomes clear, because it stops them being seen as a cost or a headcount. And suddenly the organizations understand that they are an investment. And then the whole attitude changes from looking at assistance as being a resource and starting to understand that they're a talent to be nurtured. Mm -hmm. And then the rest of it kind of follows. But the other thing that I would say is that organizations really need to let the assistants lead up. And I think the assistants very often are worried about leading up because they think their executives are going to think they're getting above themselves or that they are going to be um, annoying the executives by getting outside of what is their actual remit. But as a CEO, and I'm sure you're exactly the same, and I know Bonnie finds the same with her assistant, Jen, when you have somebody who is organizing your life like that, it's life changing because you can get on with doing the things that you are amazing at and all the detail just happens. And that's really freeing. And it means that for me as a business with only 10 people, we can go and do far more of the things that we need to do because the people who are in the back end of things are making sure that everything's organized properly. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. And it's, it's something you said that's triggered. I, I told you I may tell this story and I can't help myself. 
but uh, administrative assistants have changed my life more than once. Uh, most recently, 14 years ago, I was in a, a near fatal automobile accident and my administrative assistant, uh, a younger version of Diana Hansen, who is my administrative assistant today, 14 years ago, she started with me the week I had the automobile accident when I was CEO of uh, Campbell Soup Company. And pardon my language, but all hell broke loose. Everybody was calling the office, what's happened? What do we do? The board wanted to know. I had friends that wanted to know, families that wanted to know, employees, and we were trying to be careful with how we manage the whole thing. And uh, as she went, she was operating in the fire, as I've shared with Bonnie, it was more of a volcanic eruption uh, that week and uh, couldn't have navigated it without her. Could not, I mean, literally, the doctor saved my life in the trauma center and Diana saved my life in the workplace. And uh, I will forever be indebted to her and Today, I celebrate with Diana this uh, Administrative Professional Day. I know you're watching, Diana, and, and you are a star. But I'm going to offer one other one, and then I'm going to stop talking for most of the rest of the, this hour, if I can help it. But I'm so passionate about this, I may not be able to. Uh, when I was fired from a job years ago, and uh, I was a terrible interview. I was the world's worst interviewer. I was shy. I know it's hard to believe, but I was very shy and introverted. And my outplacement counselor said, Doug, you're going to be a, a disaster as an interview. And you got to figure out a way to navigate this that works for you, knowing you're shy and uncomfortable. So I developed this process where when I would go interview at a building, I would get the name of every person I met, starting with the receptionist at the building, and then all the administrative assistants that were helping me out. And at the end of the day, I would walk next door to the coffee shop. I would handwrite a note to each person, thanking them for their help and a, spe a specific thing that they did for me. Then I would walk them back over to the receptionist desk and ask the receptionist to have those notes delivered to everybody on the list that day. So they were getting a handwritten thank you note from me uh, within six hours of meeting me. I got to tell you, the next time I would go back to the building, the executives weren't paying any attention to me. But the, the receptionist, oh, Doug, it's so nice to have you back in the building. Who are you seeing today? Oh, you better look out. This could happen. Then the administrative assistants, oh, it's so nice to have you back here. They were the first line of defense and offense for that organization. Mm -hmm. And they were all in. And I saw the power of these people moving mountains behind the scenes to mm -hmm. facilitate productive work. And I viewed it differently now for four, almost 40 years. And, uh, uh, and uh, those personal experiences, I will never forget. And they changed my life. So when you said they can change the life of an executive, I'm with you 100%. Now, I do want to move on to talking about specific things that they can do that are within their control, mm -hmm. but I don't want to walk past the fact that organizations are not optimally set up to meet the needs of these assistants. Uh, and, you know, there's, there's, there are compensation issues, there's uh, job definition issues, there are a host of issues. Uh, that need to be addressed in a macro sense. And I, I've, I'm, Lucy, if there were a couple of those bigger issues that you see companies need to address, what would you call that? How would you call them out? I think the most important one is understanding that assistants need career progression like everybody else and a structure. And it's strange because most organizations have assistants siloed. They sit right the way across organizations. So they don't really ever talk to each other. I've lost track of the number of companies I go into where when the assistants get together for training, it is the first time that they have ever been together. And they're saying, oh, my word, thank goodness. It's not just me that's got this issue. And so I think sometimes HR miss them, not because they're being mean, but because they go through the list of departments and they go, have we covered? 
covered everybody? Well, we've covered finance and we've covered marketing and we've covered sales and assistants get missed off that because they don't have their own department or their own function. And so back in 2021, the World Administrators Alliance published the Global Skills Matrix, which I was very involved in um, helping to put together. And the Global Skills Matrix is a career framework for assistance, which has been signed off by the heads of associations from 29 different countries, including the two major ones in the United States, ASAP and the IAAP. Um, and it is looking at five different levels of assistance and the kind of skills and tasks that you can be expecting at each level. And what that does is it means that you can get into this career, and let's make no mistake, it is a career now, it isn't just a job, at the bottom level and you can work your way up. But even more importantly, what it means is that performance can be measured. And that's something that we've never been able to do before. And HR loved that because what it means is that if you can measure it, you can improve it. So if anybody was interested in looking at that, it's at globalskillsmatrix.com. It's a totally free resource. Um, and it really is transformative. I know a lot of assistants mm. are taking it to their executives, to their HR departments and are saying, where do you think I sit on this? And can we have a conversation about, you know, what it is that I would need to do if I wanted to move up a level here? Because it's very clear that somebody who sits on reception is not doing the same role as a senior EA who's looking after somebody in C-suite. Mm -hmm. But the Bureau of Labor Statistics in the United States only recognizes one level, and that is the task-based reactive assistant that is the secretary of old. Anybody who is looking at anything in the least bit strategic is finding themselves in a situation where they're lumped in with management. So really this is helping to get clarity for organizations on the way that assistants should be organized within their organizations. The only other thing that I would say is that the big buzzword coming out of COVID is collaboration. And collaboration means looking at the skill sets that you bring to the table, looking at the skill sets your executive is bringing to the table and working out how you can work together to delivering goals. And what that means is that you need to understand the goals in the first place. So it isn't any longer that the executive's up here and the assistant is down here and that there is almost a master and servant relationship where the executive is telling the assistant what to do. Can we remember it's the organization that employs you, it's not the executive. Instead, what we should be looking at is a situation where the two of you bring your skill sets to the table and you have very clear goals that you're given and the two of you go on an intellectual and emotional journey towards success so that when you achieve success, you do so together because your two skill sets have meant that the business has one complete perfect employee where you're both filling each other's skills gaps. You know, we, we talk about these things and as we talk about them, you know, to me, they make so much sense, but we have this inertia of the past that is challenging to overcome. Bonnie, how would you, would you amplify any of that or add to it? Yes. Uh, well, of course, I concur with Lucy. You know, historically, this group of people does not have a history of training because there was a belief that administrative staff does not contribute to the bottom line profits of a company. And of course, all of us on this call know that that's not true. Because as Lucy said, if, if, an, if an assistant saves their executive even an hour of time a week, time equals money. You know, I want to circle back to something you said, Doug, and that is, it, it's about, um, culture, company culture has shifted since the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And as long as we are humans in this workplace, it is going to matter to do those handwritten thank you notes. Somebody in the chat was talking about that it's not obsolete or outdated to do this. Human people do things for people. Those assistants felt seen and heard, respected and valued by you with that simple act, Doug. And I read tons of leadership articles and listen to podcasts. And the big thing that as leaders are talking about is that they're concerned about talent, retaining top talent and attracting top talent. And it still is true to do that. Company leaders need to commit 
to respecting and valuing the staff they're painstakingly hiring in the first place. And one of the ways to show respect is through training, professional development training. So while historically it doesn't, it we don't have a long path, you know, Lucy has done a lot of first time training. I've made my career doing first time training. All I know is the, the, the staff that stays, that does not want to leave, are the ones like I met at Campbell Soup when I came and did training where you were, Doug. Mm -hmm. And those assistants feel like I never want to leave here because I feel respected and valued. So my, my message to leaders is that in 2024 and going forward, training is not an option anymore. Budgets must be created to uh, build programs that will help uh, strengthen and empower and energize the administrative staff. Just They're just like top athletes. Top mm -hmm. athletes have to keep training. Well, so do your top executive assistants of the world. Mm -hmm. That's my message. Sold. Let's do it. Here we go. Uh, I, I want to... You know, we can talk about how organizations need to change and they do need to change and they are changing one organization at a time with enlightened leadership. But uh, in the meantime, we can't be sitting around waiting for our organization to change. How what advice would you give to our our many listeners who are looking for? Well, what can I do? What are some key administ key initiatives I can take? on Monday morning to kick my profile up in a healthy way that is more productive for the company and and more meaningful to me. What? Uh, let's go to uh, back to Lucy here and then we'll come back to you, Bonnie. Yeah, well, other than downloading the global skills matrix, which obviously is my first go to, yeah. I yeah. would be saying understanding the goals and KPIs of your um, executive is absolutely core here. So many mm -hmm. assistants say I've got to set my objectives for this year. I don't know what I should be doing. It's very hard to set goals and KPIs for assistants. Well, when you understand what the goals and KPIs are that your executive has been set and you understand what success looks like for them this year and you understand what they're trying to achieve, mm -hmm. suddenly it becomes far clearer um, what mm -hmm. it is that you're needing to do in order to be seen as being somebody who's contributing. But I would also say that you really need to understand your business. There's a great deal of difference between knowing and understanding. And most assistants know lots about their businesses, but they don't really understand it. So now is the time to be going to those meetings where they say, come, look, it's quarter, end of quarter. We're going to tell you what's happening in the business, what's coming up. And I know that for most assistants, they sit there thinking, kill me now. This is two hours of my life. I'm never ever going to get back. <laughs> But um, and they're sitting there composing emails in their heads. But really understanding the business, making the case for attending leadership meetings, because you know what? When you attend leadership meetings, you take on a lot of information by osmosis. Richard Branson's assistant, Helen Clark, attends all his leadership meetings and not to take the minutes because you listen in a different way if you're there to take the minutes. She's there because she is listening to what he's agreeing to and she calendars it. So he no longer has to take notes. She is literally just taking note of what it is he's agreed to do and putting it in the calendar, which as a CEO, I think that's fabulous. I love that. But also she's watching what other people are agreeing to and she's keeping them to time if it's going to affect what he's doing. And she's watching body language to see whether anybody around the table doesn't mm. get it mm. so that they get a further explanation. But most importantly, I think she can see what's coming down the track. She can see if there are going to be bottlenecks. She's able to anticipate and see round corners. And most importantly, she is learning how to speak the language of business, because I think for many assistants, they know what they want to say, but they're not sure whether they've got the right language. So they don't speak up because they're nervous about doing so in case they look stupid. So I think there are three very practical ways there that you can start to put yourself into the line where people are going to be able to see you and understand what it is that you're bringing to the party. That's that's beautiful. Now, she's probably stolen half of your thunder, Bonnie, but uh, what's the other half, other thoughts you have about? There are 
There's so much to unpack here about what assistants can do themselves um, in this workplace. There, you know, I'm look glancing at the Q and A. What's clear is that there's a lack of clarity for what this role is in 2024. I wrote an article for Harvard Business Review called "Is Executive Assistant the Right Career for You?" Um, it, it's a there needs to be definition for this role, and that starts with the job description. So one thing every assistant can do is put your job description, your current job description in writing that HR professionals have shared with me. They don't have time to revamp job descriptions, that they know that they've changed in the aftermath of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. you know, assistants um, get a little annoyed when people say, so what do you do exactly? What, <laughs> what's your, what do you do? Yeah. So it really begins there is putting the job description in writing so that you're ready to clarify what is it that you do. And then for yourself, you get to understand what is it that you really want to do and to look for those gaps. I call them gaps, places, room for improvement, the things that need to be that, that are broken, that need to be fixed. In addition, I would say if your company does not yet have a learning and development budget for assistance, which I am a big advocate of, that I urge all recruiters to build into job um, offers, is to pay for it yourself. It is about investing in your own professional development so that if you need a course in artificial intelligence, in project management, whatever it is, it's about being honest with yourself about how do you strengthen yourself of coming as you see the needs of the organization? Um, and there are so many gaps, things like onboarding, offboarding, cybersecurity, disaster planning, succession planning. There are so many areas that assistants are eminently qualified to offer solutions and suggestions about. But as Lucy said, many assistants are reluctant to speak up or to ask to be in that meeting. And my suggestion is to talk with your leaders directly yeah. about your ambitions, about what is it that you see for yourself. Um, most leaders are not used to assistance talking like that. Well, I, I couldn't agree with you more. And uh, you, it takes more courage, it takes courage to do that. Uh, and uh, preparing yourself for those meetings so that you can go in and courageously uh, inquire about opportunities is- But is, didn't you appreciate it, Doug, when your it. assistants did it. that, and you it. as a CEO? Yeah, yeah. I, but I can understand having, most of my life I did not spend as a CEO. I was the person on the other side of the table trying to make a point, a shy, introverted guy, who was trying to uh, ask the right way and trying to navigate things just like anybody else. And I know it takes courage to kind of, what do, what do they say, truth to power? Uh, mm -hmm. to, to, share, to share that that perspective, which makes complete sense, but to actually share it uh, with your leader can be difficult at times, but it can be done and it should be done. I would agree with that. I have one, I'm gonna offer my own uh, piece that just occurred to me. Uh, I think Lucy uh, shared the notion of administrative assistants working together to uh, sort of support each other because they naturally aren't, organizations aren't built that way. I wanna give a shout out to my former uh, assistant before uh, Diana Hansen, Sally Collins. She started as an affinity group, if you will, the uh, Campbell Assistant Professional Group, CAPS, they called themselves. Mm -hmm. And they it spread like wildfire. Basically, we had all the assistant professionals connecting with each other, sharing uh, issues, uh, gathering together in various pods, wherever they were located geographically. And, uh, and I think they, they, they found their voice as a community which gave each individual member, I think, a little more confidence that they could move forward on their own. So anybody can start a administrative professional group of where you're doing some sharing. And I would encourage any and all administrative professionals 
to think about creating your own little community in your place of work where you can actually draw from those experiences. And uh, uh, I've seen it change the way, the dynamic in the office. So I would encourage that. Before absolutely, I- Absolutely, Doug. What, can I just say something? Yeah, please. I think that you're absolutely correct about that, but I would almost go one step further and say that organizations need to look at putting departments in place. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Excuse me, a department or a function, because the minute it's a department or a function rather than a network, you have structure, you have leadership, you have budget, you have performance review, you have KPIs mm. and goals, just like everybody else in the organization. And for me, I think you wouldn't expect for finance or marketing or sales to be told, go and make yourself a little group and network with each other and work out how you're going to do it. Yeah. You would have chaos. So why do they expect that the assistants are going to be able to manage themselves properly when they have no structure and expected to yeah. learn themselves? Well, yeah, I, 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 that would be wonderful. Uh, Sally created it as an affinity group and our yep. affinity groups at Campbell had a budget for uh, when they created their groups and, uh, and they had some leadership, there was some structure to it, but I think you'd have to think about how you did that very carefully, but it yeah. can be done. And I, what I discovered my whole career, I discovered that I had more power than I thought I did every step of the way. And uh, I would say administrative professionals have more power than they think they do if mm -hmm. they're to, and they can navigate these waters. That's my belief. Now, before we're about to turn it over to, to our audience, but I'd like to, uh, before we do, so Amy, this is my last question and I'm not talking anymore or I, I'm trying not to. Uh, if, you, if you each had like one or two short pieces of advice that you would want to leave with these people, you'll have a chance at the close to uh, offer something as well. What one piece of advice would you leave for each of our attendees? Uh, let's start with uh, Lucy. I think go and have conversations with your executives and your HR departments now, because as Bonnie said right at the top, post-COVID organizations are looking at ways to measure ROI on every employee, the return on investment and the contributions to the bottom line for every employee. And the first time ever, this is including assistance. And they are coming to us and asking us in their droves how they do that. Mm -hmm. So if you have those conversations now and you show them the global skills matrix, then they will build it into the businesses of the future. We've got a really small window of opportunity, I think, to do that before organizations go, well, the change has just happened. So the change is now, everything just changed. So what's one more change? Go have the conversations. Don't leave it to somebody else. Don't think I'll do it down the track. Do it now. Thank you. Bonnie, what would your piece of advice be? Other than listen to Lucy. Yeah, I mean, I just adore hearing what she has to say. Uh, my advice for every assistant is to have an attitude change about, because Lucy said, there, it's no longer a hierarchy with leaders up here and lowly assistants down here. The mindset needs to shift to be the CEO of you incorporated, that you are in charge of your career and your life. Mm -hmm. You get to decide how this is going to go. And Doug, you said the word collaboration. I see that the future of the administrative staffs of the world is about collaboration and cooperation. I will never forget Olympia Dukakis saying to me, Bonnie, you do not have to be an expert in everything, but you do need to know who the experts are to get the answers we need fast. And you know who's the, who those people are? All, all the people on your team. At CAPS, it was an internal assistant network. Externally, there are all kinds of groups to belong to externally. We need each other. Nobody can be an expert in everything. So we need to find ways in this group that is still 93 to 97% female yeah. to do this, my friends. We must 
collaborate and cooperate with each other. That's our move for a very powerful and successful future. Whoa. All right. Uh, yeah. Now, Amy, you've got to top my questions and you have to come up with some uh, themes from our audience. There's been a lot of uh, chatter here. So, uh, Amy, uh, take it away and you can direct the Q&A. Absolutely. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you all for this conversation. This has been great. We have a lot of questions. Um, I am going to bundle two of them because I think they connect to a lot of what you've both been talking about, which is sort of the murkiness around the job description. Um, so we have one question from Aliviana, which is, is the title executive assistant interchangeable with administrative professional? And then we also have a question from, well, I can't find it now, but it was from Anne. Oh, do you feel like the new executive assistant is morphing more into a chief of staff position where we work to make sure our executive team is as successful as possible? Um, so kind of a two-parter, but I, we'll start with Lucy and then we can go to Bonnie for this one. Oh my goodness, I could be here for hours. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, there are 162 job titles that we have managed to find in this profession so far, and it is causing immense confusion. If you think mm -hmm. about the fact that in the UK, we tend to have PAs and EAs, and in America, a PA is someone who looks after somebody of high net worth or a celebrity, and in uh, Europe, it's usually management assistant. And now there are questions over it, whether it should be the title assistant at all. Um, and what I'm seeing certainly when we're um, involved in reorganizations is that organizations are looking at any word other than assistant. I'm seeing administrative business partner. I'm seeing administrative coordinators, administrative mm -hmm. um, business leads. Certainly the word business is in there. Assistant seems mm -hmm. to be going the way of secretary um, so that organizations are seeing that people who are in this role are assisting are not assisting anymore they are doing um, and chief of staff I, I will be really vocal and it might not be popular but what I would say is that I don't think chief of staff is a shoe in for an assistant is it's an entirely different role mm -hmm. and what is happening is that because organizations don't know how to promote their assistants and the assistants want to be promoted they are giving them the title of chief of staff in order to give them that elevation. But a chief of staff role is something entirely different. It is a senior VP position, usually, and it needs some form of people management qualification or MBA. And if you think about the trio, and then I'll be quiet, what you're looking at is the, ex the chief executive who's facing out into the world, who's going driving the business forward, coming up with new revenue streams, making sure that the organization is known in the world. You have the EA who is managing the office of the CEO and making sure that the day-to-day -day is working properly. And then you have the chief of staff. Chief of staff is facing inward, doing the role of the CEO when they're not there. So they're almost like a stunt double, but they're managing the rhythm of the organization. They're identifying frustrations. They're working on projects that the CEO doesn't have time to get to. And they are making sure that they're doing meetings that maybe the CEO can't get to also. So it's a very different role. The common denominator is process and procedure. And of course, if you do the work, you might be able to get to that role. For me, the question is now whether what we're going to do is to dumb down the chief of staff role because we're giving it to senior EAs as a title or whether we are going to come up with some new kind of hybrid level or whether chief of staff needs its own global skills matrix of which the senior EA is the bottom level of that. But it's such a mess at the moment. And I really think that we shouldn't be telling EAs the next point on your career path is to be a chief of staff. Right. Mm. May I just add a little bit to that? Of course, please, Bonnie, after if you're up. <laughs> um, chief of staff is very much about managing other people. And someone can be a really great executive assistant but it doesn't equate with being a great manager of people. And so around the world, what I'm seeing um, to add just a little bit to what Lucy said is, is frustration 
over titles, that titles are not matching what people are actually doing. And that's where the conversation is coming in. I don't really see the word assistant leaving us anytime very soon, but I do see the entrance of many other titles in response to the needs of the team. Here's the thing, uh, people will leave jobs because of a, of a poor title and they're leaving jobs because of a lack of a job description what we're hearing in this question, in these two questions, Amy, is the need to clarify the structure of companies. What I'm, I'm talking with many assistants who are in companies where right now, right this minute, there's a conversation about restructuring the whole staff to respond to the new needs of this workplace. And I hope that assistants are brought into that conversation to help with create this new structure because assistants are frustrated that it's not fair because titles lead to job descriptions, lead to compensation. And it's the money that is not fair either. Doug, did you want to add anything before I go to the next question? No, they, they've, they've got it covered. I'm just trying to keep up with them. <laughs> Thank you both for those fantastic answers. I'm going to go. This is the perfect opportunity to answer this. Um, we have a question from Jillian. This kind of ties into yesterday's session was about cultural fluency. Uh, the question is, is collaboration culturally affected? The USA can be seen as more confident in communication. Mm -hmm than the UK, for example. Uh, and we'll start with Bonnie this time and then Lucy build on what Bonnie said. You never before have we had so many cultures working together because of this remote and hybrid world we're in. So I heard about an amazing book that I that I really checked out and I it's coming by Amazon today called The Culture Map. And it's, it is a Aaron Myers, I believe, is the uh, author of the culture map, and it is it clarifies truths about different cultures. It, it Jill, it definitely it, culture and um, country absolutely impacts the way we're collaborating. And they're so big surprise. We need communication on how that's going to go. You know, if no one should be surprised that there are there are miscommunications and conflicts between cultures if we're not educated about them. I feel sure Lucy's been to way more countries than me. What are you thinking about that, Lucy? I tend to think is that when we're always asked, uh, are is the assistant role different in different countries? And to me, it's more about whether the attitude to women is different than anything else. So oh, the countries where I find um, we have to maybe go into a little more depth and there needs to be more encouragement for them to speak up is where um, you have to get over the issue of whether women have a voice before you start talking about what the skill sets are. But mm. by the end of it, you know, the ones that start off at the beginning going, oh, I don't know if I can do that, are up presenting project plans. So, you know, uh, once you get the encouragement and they understand what they're speaking about and they're starting to get confidence because they understand the language to use, there's absolutely no problem, I don't think. It's just about them understanding their part to play within the organisation in the first place and that they are valuable. Yeah, yeah, I, I am going to chime in here. Uh, I think uh, culture is is one of the keys to making all of this work. Look, we all are in every organization. We're part of an organization system. And that system is affecting everything we do as a manager, as an entry level employee, as an executive, as a, a director as an administrative professional, there's this system of activities that affect how we perform. And uh, so I think culture is something that everyone needs to pay attention to. And I'll, I'll use an example. When I was at Campbell, uh, we didn't really have, in my opinion, uh, we didn't have a very adequate uh, performance review system. And so and it didn't make sense that we were reviewing executives and managers uh, at a high level uh, in, a, in a different way than everyone else in the company. So we created one 
uh, per one performance review process. And we had six expectations of our leaders and they applied to the receptionist at the front of the building, as well as the executives at the top. Uh, and embedded in it were differentiated expectations based on their roles. But the first job of everyone was to inspire trust of all the people that, with whom we worked. And that was true for the receptionist, the administrative professional, and me as the CEO. And uh, the next one was to create direction. Once you build trust, then you, you sort of have permission to work with people to create a path forward. That was true for the administrative professional and for me as the CEO. Then you had to align the organization to be able to go do it. It was true for me as a CEO. And then the admins too had to figure out how are we gonna get this done? And then it was about building organization vitality and giving the whole organization the energy to actually do it, executing with excellence and producing results. And those six expectations applied to everybody. And once we started at a high level with against a mission and a performance review system at a high level that was the same, we all started to get on the same page. And, uh, and so the culture is a big deal and everybody in the organization can, can have an impact there. So uh, I encourage our CAPS people at Campbell, they changed the way the administrative professionals were viewed in our culture. They took that charge. They started showing up differently, more proactively. They were inspiring trust. They were creating mm -hmm. direction. And before you knew it, they were viewed as people who were inspiring trust and creating direction. So uh, this culture thing is a big deal. And I'll be quiet. I think assistants are core to creating culture within their businesses. Oh, actually. absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, Amy, let's get to another question before we, we're going to have to let Lucy go in seven minutes. So uh, okay. let's, get yeah, let's squeeze question this question in because it's a good one. Uh, it is from Chiara or Ciara. Sorry if I mispronounced your name. Uh, I have a question. What can we do to rebrand the community congeniality thing in regards to our profession? I find there is a school of thought that our primary contribution is being likable and that our jobs can be interchangeable. So Lucy, we'll start with you before we lose. <laughs> <the one. laughs> oh, goodness. I think it starts with how we see ourselves. I think um, many mm. assistants say to me, I want to be treated like a business person. I want to be treated like everybody else. I want to be seen as core business. I don't want to be seen as just the assistant. How do I do that? And I say, well, do the work. Do the work. Go and learn about the business. Read everything. Insert yourself into situations where you feel uncomfortable. Put your hand up for things that are outside of your comfort zone. Make sure that the leadership team and the rest of the team is seeing as you as somebody who has a contribution to make and a contribution that is business savvy so that they can't anymore ignore you. Simone White, who is a wonderful advocate also for this marketplace, said to me quite recently that you really have to put yourself in a position where we're no longer just sitting amongst ourselves as a profession, talking about how we're not seen and heard. We have to make it unforgivable to be left out because we are so good at what we do and we are so visible that they have to include us. Mm, that's great. Yeah, it's it's a big subject because we're talking about a population, a profession that's 93 to 97% female that has a long history of women working with other women and that likability factor um you know, I I believe there are double standards in play and and that women are judged mm -hmm. harshly among one another. And therefore, you know, in, in my book, Staff Matters, I have a chapter called Sex, which is about gender differences in the workplace. That whole likability thing, it, it's, women are kind of, pardon me, damned if we do, damned if we don't. Mm -hmm. and, and if we're not likable enough, we're called aggressive and, or too assertive, or we, there are, 
Um, it's a tricky road to, to go down. And when we're communicating over a webcam, it gets even more complicated. So we, essentially we need to have some new rules, new rules of engagement in our workplace as we restructure teams about how are we going to show up and, and you know, I don't believe we have any time for any nonsense anymore about um, behaviors that are nothing less than professional and respectful. Because if every if anybody on a team has been hired for a reason, if they're there working for a company, somebody hired them at some point, and there's a reason they're there, and that is worthy of respect. And that our job is to find out what that is and to begin there. Thank you, Bonnie. Thank you. I'm going to uh, cut over to Lucy before she abandons us uh -huh. uh, uh, and uh, and then give her a chance for a last thought. And then, Amy, I'll turn it back to you and we can invite Bonnie to have a last thought and you can take it from there. But I don't want to miss this powerful closing thought from Lucy. But don't feel any pressure. <laughs> You know, Doug, today is Administrative Professionals Day, and I was reminded earlier on this week about an interview that I did with a wonderful woman called Karen Nussbaum. Now, Karen Nussbaum was the lady that back in the 1970s, so 50 years ago now, founded the 9 to 5 movement in America. And they were talking about the fact that the 20 million um, office workers who were women needed to be treated properly and that they needed the same as everybody else within organizations. And she really campaigned hard. And you will see if you go back and you look at it, that there are, there's her and um, uh, thousands of women marching with banners that say raises, not roses. And was saying that Administrative Professionals Day really should be about recognizing the contribution that assistants make and encouraging organizations to really invest in their assistance because it's going to be great for the bottom line. We're 50 years on. And when I interviewed her, she was really quite emotional. She's in her 50s, now, her 80s now. And she was saying she didn't know whether in her lifetime we'd get it over the finishing line. It's time. I've promised her that we will do everything in our power. And I know from conversations with Bonnie, she's there with me, that we will do everything in our power to make sure that this section of the workforce, which, let's face it, is half a billion women globally, mm -hmm. and the men, of course, but half a billion women globally are incorporated into their organizations and the organizations start to treat them with the respect that they deserve. And you will have our full support. Uh, you, Amy, I turn it back to you. And if you want to orchestrate the Bonnie's comments in the close, that would be great. Sure. Thank you so much, Lucy. So appreciate you being here and for all your insights. I'll um, see you soon. Yes. See you soon. Enjoy that. Thank you for the invitation. <laughs> now we can we can talk about her now that she's here. <laughs> yeah so you can you can leave I'm now okay. you can leave Thank now you. And then we'll Bye. talk about you. I uh, I do want to um give you Bonnie an opportunity to just share your closing thoughts with us. Uh, what would you like to leave our audience with on top of all the great insights you've shared already? Well, thank you, Amy. You're always so great at this. Uh, there are so many things flying through my head. It's you know, if the pandemic showed us all anything, it's that none of us really knows what tomorrow is going to bring. You know, life changed so drastically so fast. And so for that reason, I think, well, what are we waiting for then? If, in, if not now, when to make the changes that need to be made? And if not you, who is going to do it? Mm -hmm. I urge everyone on this call to make today the day where you take the risk to speak up about the issues that matter. I suspect many people on this call are parents and grandparents. And if you see from your very powerful and influential seat that there are things that there are things that are broken that need to be fixed, then be the one be part of the change in collaboration and cooperation with others. Um, you know, for me, it's very personal. I see too much workplace bullying, too much sexual harassment. The wage gap is very real. And 
unless we grab a hold of this thing now, each one of us has an opportunity to have a voice in the conversation if we insist on that. Um, I urge us to do so if we want this new workplace to be better for our children and grandchildren. And that that's what I want. And I'm going to, for as long as I can keep doing it, that's what I'm about. Those are fantastic, uh, inspiring closing thoughts. Thank you, Bonnie. Um, Doug, I don't know if you wanted to add a final thought before I go to the our no, conclusion. Well, no pressure. I, I'm just Hard to deeply, follow. I'm deeply moved by uh, mm -hmm. having the opportunity to share this conversation with Bonnie. And Thank Lisa. you, Doug. Thank you for caring. And, you know, I never forget about you that you tied your compensation to that of your assistant. How smart is that? How ahead of your time was that? I really applaud you for that. Well, I would say that uh, executives need to be part of this conversation, too, as we talk yes. about organization systems. And executives need to stand up and be counted here also. And uh, uh, and I think they will if they're encouraged by the people that you're talking to, uh, if they stand up and ask them to be more forward thinking. So yes. let's, uh, on that note, uh, Amy, I'm going to turn it over to you because we're out, almost out of time. Great. Well, thank you so much again to our extraordinary panelists, Lucy and Bonnie, for sharing your time and expertise with us today. Thank you to our host, Doug Conant, as always. And always want to thank our participants to your questions and engagement really help make these sessions sing for everyone. I'm gonna tell you about some exciting ways to engage with Conant Leadership's suite of training and content. But first, make sure to learn more about our guests and their books. They are both celebrated authors at the links that uh, my colleague Emma will be sharing in our chat or may have already. Um, then don't miss tomorrow's Blueprint Leadership Summit session, 12 p.m. Eastern time. We have the incredible Dr. Vince Molinaro, the founder and CEO of Leadership Contract Inc. He's a prolific author of five books and an expert on the topic of accountability. He'll be joining us to talk about the secrets to inspiring a culture of accountability tomorrow. That's gonna be a great session. And I always just like to reiterate here because we get this question a lot. We do send recordings of each day's session to all registrants. If you can't attend one day live or if you missed one already, we've got you covered. Next, in honor of Administrative Professionals Day, we are delighted to announce an exciting online course that's been in development here at Conant Leadership for a while. And it's really designed, we, we have a lot of training and content that is to help leaders. And this course specifically is designed to empower administrative professionals to lean into their leadership superpowers, to make a difference in their organizations, to maximize their impact, and to develop joyful and fulfilling careers. This course launching this fall is called STEPS, Success Through Empowering Professional Support. And it adapts the blueprint process specifically for the needs of administrative superheroes. So you can sign up at the link in our chat to be the first to hear when this new course goes live this fall. Next, our signature leadership development program, the Blueprint Bootcamp, is a two-day virtual leadership course. It offers highly interactive training with Doug, who personally teaches the course. And it's also with a community of your leadership peers, and it's followed by personal mentorship and community with Doug. We are currently enrolling for both our June and November programs, although the June enrollment closes the first week in May. So if you'd like to explore this transformational tier of leadership development, design your own leadership model, develop your own personal leadership approach in a lively and supportive group learning environment, you can sign up today at ponentleadership.com slash bootcamp. Reach out to our fantastic head of programs, Emma, at emma at conantleadership.com. Or you can also schedule a free 15-minute consultation call with Emma at the Calendly link in our chat. We're also happy to offer a special limited time coupon code for Summit attendees. You can use the code SUMMIT500 at checkout to get $500 off the registration price of our June or November bootcamp. But the code does expire next week, so act quickly um, and we'll send some reminders via email too. Finally, you can find our newsletter and our suite of leadership resources at conantleadership.com 
or at Doug Conant on Twitter and LinkedIn. And you can explore our entire library of past summit sessions with luminaries like Brene Brown, Andrew Nui, Dan Pink, and many, many, many more in our video resources. As always, if you have any follow-up questions about any of our offerings, please reach out to us. We're here to help. I've been your moderator, Amy Fetterman. Thank you again to our guests and for our host, Doug Conant. Thank you. And we hope to see you tomorrow for our session with Vince Molinaro. Thank, thank you, everyone. Bonnie. You were great. Good job. Mwah. Now get Thanks, back Amy. to work, everybody. Thank get you, to work.